Luke chapter 24, page 1061 of the Church Bibles, starting from verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Let's pray, and then we will look at that passage together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, and we pray now that the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words to be written through Luke would be opening our minds and our hearts to it. In Jesus' name, amen. So children, I want to encourage you if, you, if you are able to read and you've got a Bible in front of you, please do follow along as well with the grown-ups. I encourage the adults as well to keep that passage open. Um, now, have you ever been somewhere where you've perhaps gone along somewhere and you've recognized someone or sort of half recognized somebody and can't quite place them? Maybe children, you've been playing in the park and there's another child playing next to you and you sort of maybe recognize them from school or from a club, but you can't quite remember, or maybe grown-ups, that's happened to you, and you can't quite put your finger on it. Several years ago, we were out walking in a, in a city miles from where we lived, and coming down the pavement, the same side coming towards us, was somebody that we really recognized, that we knew, um, that obviously didn't live in this place, who was also visiting this place, and I couldn't quite remember who, what her name was or sort of where she was from, and we had this conversation, we were chatting, and I was sort of bluffing my way through the conversation, sort of pretending that I uh, remembered who she was, and was doing quite well, until my dad came and joined us and said, so how do you know each other? <laughs> and we had this awful moment where she didn't say anything, and I had to sort of, we had to guess a, a city or a town that we'd lived in that we knew. So we said Southampton, which was the wrong answer, because she looked very confused, and it was incredibly awkward. Now, maybe you've had something of that uh, in your life. Here in this passage in Luke 24, two of Jesus' disciples, Cleopas and, and somebody else, are walking along, and Jesus is with them, and yet they don't recognize who he is. 
They don't see him for who he is. There's a reason for that, but they don't see who he is. Thankfully, Jesus goes on to explain, to tell them, and as he explains who he is, he tells us that the Bible is all about him, that the story of the Bible is about Jesus, and that's what helps us to truly recognize him, to truly see who he really is. Now, this morning, we're going to ask four questions of the passage, four questions to help us to understand it. The first is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Now, it may be that you've been part of this church for a very long time. Maybe, like Lewis, you've grown up in the church. It may be that perhaps you're a visitor today. Um, you're perhaps a guest, or you, you've just come along, you're new. At this church, we often talk lots about Jesus. We sing songs that are about Jesus. All three of our songs have been about Jesus. We pray, often praying, in Jesus' name. Our sermons, our uh, Bible readings are about Jesus. The children's groups, when they happen, are often about Jesus, centered on him. We're all about Jesus. We love Jesus. And yet, of course, we know that there are lots of people who don't know anything about Jesus. Perhaps children in your family or in your school. There are people who don't really know much about Jesus, who are confused. Perhaps they don't know uh, who he is or why he came. Or perhaps you have work colleagues that don't know much about Jesus. Some people say Jesus was just a good man. Some say he was perhaps just a, a holy man, but nothing more than that. Perhaps some people might even say maybe Jesus didn't even exist at all. People are confused. Look at our passage, though. Verse 13. Some of them are walking along. They're talking with each other, and they're discussing the things that have happened. Jesus comes along, verse 17, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Now, um, I don't know if you know, children, what the word downcast means. Um, at this point, do you think that the disciples here, these followers of Jesus, do you think they're happy or are they sad? Put your thumb, if you think they're happy, put your thumbs up. Or if you think they're sad, put your thumbs down. Is it Sad. They're downcast. They're sad. Why are they sad? Well, they're a bit confused because the passage goes on and it says, Jesus of Nazareth, verse 19, was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God. But verse 20 says, the chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. You see, Jesus was this holy man that they loved, that they trusted, that they adored, that they were followers of. He was sent by God, they knew that, and yet he was handed over to be crucified. He was killed by the Romans. He'd done all these amazing miracles, and yet he died on the cross. He had suddenly and sadly died. Now, children, some of the grown-ups might be thinking, when it talks about these miracles, these powerful things that he did indeed, um, what types of things? Can, can any of the children think of any um, amazing miracles or powerful things that Jesus did when he was alive on this earth? Any amazing miracles that Jesus did? Shout them out. You can shout them out. Any ideas? Turn water into wine. Very good. The first one, turn water into wine. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Turn water into wine. Anybody else remember anything? Go on, Tal. He made a blind man see. Made a sick man better. Very good. He did loads of things. He did loads of amazing miracles. And yet, all of a sudden, he died. And so they were thinking... If Jesus was a prophet, if he was a man sent by God, God was with him, it says. God was with him, verse 19. He was a powerful uh, in word and deed before God and all the people. If that was true, why did he suddenly die? Why was he suddenly arrested and crucified on the cross? It didn't make any sense. They were sad, they were confused. How can it be true that both Jesus on the one hand, God was clearly with him, he was clearly sent by God, and yet his life has tragically ended? Because verse 21 says, we had hoped that he was going to be the one who would redeem 
Israel. They had hoped that he would be the one to rescue his people. But how could he rescue his people if he had died? They were sad. They were confused. So the first question is, who is Jesus? Well, the passage says he is mighty in the power of God, sent by God. Jesus says in verse 26 that he is the Messiah. Messiah means rescuer. So that's who Jesus is. The second question is, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Look at what happened to Jesus. Look what he did. Verse 20 says, the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. Jesus died on the cross. The hope was that he was the one to redeem Israel, verse 21. That means that he was the rescuer, the one to save his people. Children, you may remember lots of the stories of the Old Testament, some of the kings, people like David and other kings in the Old Testament who would go out and would win the victory, win the battle for God's people. If you think about the story of David and Goliath, David with his slingshot, and he defeats Goliath, and Goliath falls down, and then what does David do to Goliath once Goliath has fallen down? The bit that you don't often see in the kids' Bibles, what does he do? Lottie, your favorite bit? He chops off his head, that's right. You don't see drawings of that in the kids' Bibles. David wins the battle for God's people. The hope was Jesus as the Savior, the Messiah, would win the battle, would redeem Israel, defeat their enemies, but Jesus has died on the cross. And dead men can't win a victory, can they? He's dead. But children, we know something that these two disciples at this stage don't know. Because we know on the third day what happened, he rose from the dead. He didn't stay dead. He came back to life again. Because Jesus dying on the cross was not an accident. It was not a terrible miscarriage of justice. It was not something that was really sad, that wasn't meant to happen, like his life was cut tragically short. Jesus dying on the cross was God's plan. He came into the world so that he could die on the cross. He came for that very purpose. He came to give himself on the cross for us so that we could be saved. Now, we sometimes use the word sin. Um, Sin just means our wrongdoing, the things that we have done wrong, the things that we have said, the things that we have thought, the things that we should have done that we didn't do, and the bad things that we actually do. All those things that we have done wrong, Jesus has died in our place. He came to redeem his people by giving himself for his people. That's how he wins the victory, by giving himself on the cross, by being punished so that we don't need to be punished. Now, um, children, but also grown-ups, who here has seen the film Frozen? We've seen the film Frozen lots and lots and lots of times. Um, There's one part of Frozen, this is going to be, I'm going to give the story away here, but that's okay. In the film Frozen, there's one point at the end, in fact, I've got a picture of it, where Hans turns out to be a baddie. And he's about to kill Queen Elsa. Elsa's there just cowering. He gets his sword. He's about to kill the queen. And as you can see what happens, Elsa's sister, Anna, jumps in the way. And instead of the sword coming down on Elsa... Anna jumps in the way. Now, she gets turned to ice. That's a sort of complicated subplot. Not for, the, <laughs> not for now. That's why she's sort of white. But she, gets, she, she takes the sword. She dies in Elsa's place. And that, in some ways, is just a little picture of what is happening at the cross. Because Jesus comes to die in our place. He receives the punishment for sin, for wrongdoing, upon himself so that we can be forgiven, so that we don't have to receive that punishment. He takes it for us. Whilst we are guilty and deserving of it, and Jesus wasn't, Jesus stands in our place and takes it for himself so that we can go free, so that we can be forgiven. Now, you might know, if you really love the film Frozen, Anna doesn't stay dead, does she? She saves her sister dying in her place and then comes back to life again. I wonder where they got that idea from. Because we know in the story here with Jesus, 
Jesus doesn't stay dead. He gives himself in our place and he comes back to life again. And this is what these two disciples on the road to Emmaus are hearing. They are hearing the story that the women have gone to the tomb and Jesus is not in the tomb. That the other disciples, Peter and others, have gone and have not seen the body of Jesus. The tomb is empty. They hear that Jesus has come back to life again. Now, children, thumbs up and thumbs down again. How do you think they're feeling when they hear the news that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Do you think they're happy or do you think they're sad? Happy. Happy. Well, it's a bit of a trick question, really, because they're sort of still confused. They're not sure if they're happy. They kind of are happy, but they're also a bit confused because they don't really understand how this can happen. They don't realize that the person next to them speaking to them on the road is Jesus himself. They don't recognize him. Jesus has died on the cross for all their wrongdoing. He has risen again in victory, and yet they are confused. They don't get it. And so Jesus, when he wants to explain what's gone on, when Jesus wants to explain the meaning of why he died and the reality of his resurrection from the dead, what does he do? Well, he speaks. He explains that. So our third question is, well, what did Jesus say? Because Jesus wants to explain to them why it's true that he's died on the cross and risen again. What did Jesus say? Now, this week, um, children, you're going back to school again. You excited about going back to school? Parents, are you excited? Yes. Well, not, so much, not so much the teachers. Um, children, you're going back to school, and lots of the things you learn will perhaps be quite hard and complicated. I found lots of things hard in school, chemistry in particular, protons. What's that all about? <laughs> Electrons. Never understood anything like that. Some things are hard to understand, and perhaps, children, there will be some things that you learn over the next few weeks that are quite difficult and quite hard. And the reason that you have teachers is to explain things to teach you, to help you to understand the things that are actually quite difficult, quite complicated. Well, the disciples here are confused. They don't know what's going on. They find it hard to understand. How can Jesus have died and come back to life again? We don't understand that. And so Jesus wants to explain. Jesus wants to teach them. Jesus wants to help them to understand, and he does that by, by using his words, by explaining. Verse 25 to 27. These are the key words, I think, in this passage. Jesus says, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus says they should have known, actually, that the Messiah had to suffer and then enter his glory. They should have known these things. They were being a bit foolish, slow to understand these things. They They should have got it. You might think, how should they have known that the Messiah was going to suffer and then rise again from the dead? Because they didn't seem to get it. And the 12 disciples didn't seem to get it in the Gospels. How is it that they should have known that about Jesus? Well, they should have known it, Jesus says, because the Bible has already told them it would happen. See the logic here? You should have known it because the scriptures teach it. Verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It had already been told in the Bible, Jesus says. The Bible is about Jesus. The scriptures, the Bible, is about Christ. It tells us who he is, what he is like, why he has come, his nature. It is all about Jesus. Now, when Jesus says the scriptures, Jesus is talking here about the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament. He's saying that before the New Testament has been written. Jesus is saying, and he talks here in verse 27, Moses and all the prophets 
He's referring to the whole of the Old Testament here at this point. Moses being sort of shorthand for the first five books of the Bible, the books written by Moses, and all the prophets, which he means the whole rest of the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament, he says, speaks concerning himself. That's what Jesus says. It's all about Jesus. Now, you may think, how can the Old Testament, written hundreds, sometimes thousands of years before Jesus... How can that be all about Jesus when he hasn't yet come? Well, it's because Jesus was always God's plan. Sending Jesus to die on the cross for all of our wrongdoing was God's plan A, if I can put it like that. It was God's plan from the very beginning, in fact, from before the beginning. It was always God's plan to rescue us through his son Jesus, even before there was an us to rescue. Even before the creation of the world, it was God's plan to redeem his people. And since it was always God's plan to send Jesus, he always spoke of it. He always predicted it. He always talked about it so that one day when Jesus did come, finally, we would understand why Jesus came because he'd always been talking about it. Jesus being born 2,000 years ago, that wasn't just the start of God's plan to send Jesus. He had always planned it. And therefore, even in the Old Testament, even before Jesus came, Jesus was promised. Jesus was predicted. Jesus was talked about. What do I mean when I say that? Well, the basic storyline of the Bible finds its fulfillment in Jesus. So think of it like this. The problem of our sin, of our wrongdoing, of humans sinning against God, doing wrong things, how can we be forgiven by God? How will God forgive us? Will it be through animals dying in the place of people? Will it be through animal sacrifices? No, it's through Jesus being the true sacrifice for sin. It's Jesus giving himself on the cross that deals with the problem of sin. Or think of the question... How will God live with his people? How will God be with people? How does the holy, perfect God live with people who aren't perfect? He lives in a tent in the desert called the tabernacle. And then later in the Old Testament, there's a building called the temple where God comes to be. But God can't dwell in, God can't be contained to merely a building Later on, Jesus comes, the true dwelling place of God and man, the true tabernacle, the true temple, the place where God lives, fully God and yet also fully man. The question of how will God live with his people is answered by Jesus being fully God and a fully man. God lives with his people in Jesus Or think of the question, how will God rule his people? Moses comes and leads his people, but then Moses dies. And Joshua comes and leads the people and leads them into the promised land. But Joshua dies. And so judges come and some are good and some are bad and they die. And then the kings come and some are good and some are bad, but they die. But Jesus is the king who will rule forever, who lives forever since he has been raised to eternal life. The question of having a ruler to lead God's people is fulfilled in Jesus. Now, I hope it's very clear. I'm not doing anything clever here. I'm saying this is the storyline of the Bible. The Bible is one big story, often the problem and then the solution. The problem raised and seen in the Old Testament, Jesus is the solution. The storyline finds its fulfillment in Jesus. But it's not just the broad storyline, it's the details too. Um, Individual things and people point us to Jesus, remind us of Jesus. This is called typology. Um, Think of the temple or the sacrificial system or people who remind us of Jesus. So children, you might know some of these stories. 
people in the Old Testament who remind us, who point us forward, are a little bit like Jesus in some ways. Think of Joseph, who was loved by his father, rejected by his brothers, who suffered, and yet God used his suffering to save many people. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. Or think of Moses, who interceded for his people, stood on their behalf in God's presence. Who does that remind you of? Or think of Joshua, rescuing his people, bringing them into the place that God had promised for them. Who does that remind you of? Or think of David, a ruler, a king, after God's own heart, who loved God. Who does that remind you of? Or Solomon, the wise king, the great wise king. Who does that remind you of? Or Job, the innocent sufferer who makes intercession for his enemies. Who does that remind you of? Or think of Esther, the brave queen who goes into the presence of the king and rescues her people. Who does that remind you of? Or Boaz, the faithful and godly husband who provides for his wife. Who does that remind you of? We could go on and on and on. The answer is Jesus. I can hear some of the kids whispering, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. All of these people are to point us to Jesus. It's called typology. Now, there's a famous, um, I think it's Charles Spurgeon, great Baptist minister, uh, told a story about an old Welsh preacher who said that in every, every village, in every hamlet in Britain, there is a road that leads to London. You know, you might be in some village somewhere miles and miles away, and there's a country lane that leads to a bigger road, that leads to a bigger road that eventually leads to the motorway that eventually leads to London. Every road leads to London. It's a very English-centered view of the United Kingdom, in my opinion. But you know, you know the point. Every, every road eventually comes to London. And the point he was making is every passage of Scripture, every bit, every word, every sentence, every verse, every chapter leads to Jesus. He's at the center of it all. And every bit eventually finds its way to him. Now, some of the bits are more obviously about Jesus, very clearly connected to Jesus. That's like the sort of motorway into London, the M4, if you like. I'm pushing the illustration a bit here. But there are some bits which are so clearly about Jesus, but there are other bits which are still about Jesus. They paint the way to him. They, they find their fulfillment. They find their way being worked out in Jesus. It all leads us to him. It is all about Jesus in the end. And I can say that confidently because Jesus says it. Jesus says the way to understand the Bible the way to understand God's revelation to us is with Jesus at the center. He is the framework by which we read the Bible, and particularly here by which we read the Old Testament. It is about Jesus. It's about Christ. Everything in the Bible is about him. Now, we are going to sing again now. After we sing, we're going to think about what does that mean for us as a church? What does it mean that we say Jesus is the center of the Bible. But before that, we are going to sing again. We're going to sing our praises to Jesus and think about what he's done for us on the cross. So let's stand, and then we'll come back to that passage in a moment. Um, and uh, keep the passage open as we think about the final question now. Um, we've seen who Jesus is. He's the Savior, the, the mighty one sent by God. What did Jesus do? He, he died and he rose again. What did Jesus say? He said the whole of the Bible is about him. It all points forward to him. The question for us then is how, how do we respond? What do we respond with in light of that? And we can say because the Bible is all about Jesus, we can respond with confidence. We can be confident that our sins, all of our wrongdoing, can be forgiven through Jesus. You see, God had always promised to forgive our, sin, uh, forgive our sins through his son, Jesus. God promised it from the very beginning. God had always said that he would send his son. He always predicted it. He always spoke about it. The Old Testament promised it. The New Testament reveals it. And it means that we can be confident that message is true. That message is God's consistent message to us. Time and time and time again, it has been God's message to humanity for thousands and thousands of years that there is forgiveness of sins through the Messiah, through the, through the Messiah, through the rescuer Jesus. 
That is God's message to humanity for centuries, for millennia. And God keeps his promises. God does not change. God's promise remains. We can be confident we are forgiven if we trust Jesus. That has always been God's message. And it means if you're very young or you're very old, whoever you are, you can be forgiven and be friends with God. That is always God's message to human beings. If we trust Jesus, if we look to him, if we say sorry for all that we've done wrong and trust Jesus' death for us, no matter how young we are, no matter how old we are, we can be confident we are forgiven before him. That is always God's promise. Now, we are going to, um, next week, and all being well for um, nine weeks following that, thinking, be thinking about uh, how this fits together in the Bible. We're going to be doing a, a, an overview of the Bible. We're going to be calling it the story of redemption, thinking about how those different parts of the Bible, different storylines of the Bible fit together and find their fulfillment in Jesus, how Jesus is at the center of the scriptures. We're going to be particularly tracing the theme of God making a covenant, God making a promise with his people, and seeing how all of it fits together in one story with Christ at the center. We're going to be doing that um, on Sunday mornings uh, in the sermon, but we're also, the children are going to be following along doing the same thing, and our care groups uh, will be following along midweek as well. So join us for that. Please be praying for that. Please come along. And as we think about how actually the Bible does fit together, how it all does point to Jesus starting next Sunday. So we can be confident in the message of the Bible, confident that our sins are forgiven. But also we respond by having hearts which burn within us. I love this. This is one of my favorite bits of the whole Bible. Verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Seeing Jesus in all of scripture is to raise our affections towards him. It is to lead us to delight in him, to love him, to have a sort of a warm glow in us as it were. To see Jesus promised in the promises, in the shadows, the types, hinted at, see his name echoed, seeing the story develop and find its fulfillment in Jesus. All of those things are to stoke a love, a desire, fuel love for Jesus, to have our hearts burn within us. It's not merely an intellectual exercise, but it's a deeply experiential one where we come to experience more of the Lord Jesus, where our hearts burn within us, where we're led to wonder, to worship, to delight in the Savior, not merely to sort of comprehend the words on the page. We are to read the scriptures as Christians, not as Jews in the synagogue. We are to read the scriptures as followers of the Messiah, of Christ, who is the fulfillment of the scriptures. We're not unbelieving Jews. We are to read it with Christ at the center. And therefore, all of our Bible studies are to have Christ at the center. There shouldn't be a place in our church for Christless Bible studies or Christless sermons. They are to lead us to Jesus because Jesus says the whole of the scriptures are about him. And we do that, whether that's in studying the scriptures together or whether it's in our personal quiet times, our personal reading of the Bible. We read it seeing how it finds its fulfillment in Jesus so that we have hearts which burn within us with love and desire for Christ. You see, that affection in our heart, that desire for Jesus, the sort of inner glow of the Holy Spirit tenderness of heart, softness of heart, only comes about by thinking about Jesus, by contemplating Jesus. 
by having him in our minds. That is the goal of every sermon you ever hear, should be the goal of every sermon you ever hear. It's the goal of every time you open up the Bible, whether that's to read it for yourself or with others, It's to think about Jesus, to contemplate him, and therefore to have a heart which burns within you with love and desire for Jesus, affections for him. So let us pray that we as a church, whether it's corporately or individually, read the scriptures with that in mind, to contemplate the glory and the beauty of Jesus, and therefore to have hearts which burn within us with joy and affection for our Saviour. I'm going to pray that for us, and then we're going to sing in response. Father, we pray that we would have that response of verse 32, of burning hearts, of a joyful, affectionate walk with Jesus. Help us, we pray. Help us this week as we look at the scriptures to see how they point us to Jesus. Help us to love him, fuel our love for him. We pray. We pray for more of the Holy Spirit's work in our heart to soften us, to give us a greater love for our Saviour Jesus. And we pray particularly over the next um, couple of months as we look at the story of redemption, of how all the scriptures find their fulfilment in Christ. Would we have burning, soft hearts? We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing. Great song to finish. Jesus loves me. This I know. The Bible tells us so. Let's stand and let's sing.